Welcome to a special episode of the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. And today we are doing what we've called the abstract with Sarah Laverty and I, Sarah, it's good to have you back on here again. Hey guys. Um, so we are going to, again, uh, Sarah has her background in exercise physiology and her degree in that, and she's combing through research constantly and we are creating content from that, but we, sometimes some of that research doesn't make it into content that we create. Sometimes it's just like a musing that we have, um, or sometimes you kind of get a sneak peek at it here on the podcast before maybe you see other videos of it. So, uh, we are going to talk about willpower today. Uh, is that correct, uh, Sarah? And then I'll cover one topic at the end with that as well that I've been looking into. But this is where we talk about the research we've been looking into. So Sarah, willpower. Um, where do you want to start? Yeah. Um, so this is something that uh, the likes of Andrew Huberman has covered recently. And it was fascinating. I listened to that podcast and I wanted to look at that research that he discusses and see how it applies to endurance athletes. So it's no secret that to reach your potential as an endurance athlete, you need a hefty amount of willpower. <laughs> um, yeah. And with that, like, what is willpower? Willpower is you need willpower to intervene with the default neural processes. So that is, for example, you're doing a VO2 max workout and you're on the second to last interval and your brain is telling <laughs> you to stop and uh, you're, you're, you have to override that to continue and finish the workout and therefore get faster. So um, that is how willpower comes into cycling. And we... What can we learn from the research that can help us improve our willpower and therefore help us get faster? So the preliminary research on willpower um, was done by Baumeister and colleagues um, in the late 1990s. And their research suggested that willpower was a limited resource, meaning that it should be used judiciously and we should uh, prioritize our tasks in terms of which requires the most willpower, what's the most important, because it will get depleted, um, as mm. in our willpower will get depleted. So in their study, the, how they uh, made this conclusion was uh, they had participants complete various tasks that required willpower to refrain or engage in a variety of behaviours. Um, so they had other participants then in a control condition who didn't need to engage their willpower. And what they did then was a subsequent task um, after they had, um, so they completed one task. Uh, demanding task, then um, an activity that would require their willpower and not require their willpower, and then complete another demanding task. And they were trying to see if having used your willpower already or exerted a certain amount of willpower, would that mm. impact your ability to complete the subsequent challenging mental task? Um, hmm. And what they found kind was... Simple. Yeah, very like simple. simple. Yeah, simple experiment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and we can relate it to what we're like. So if I'm, for example, um, at work or doing this podcast today, is my workout afterwards going to, uh, am I going to be able to exert willpower in my workout afterwards? Um, so in a similar way, they, they had the, the demanding task after. Um, and what they found, yeah, was that having exerted willpower impeded their ability to complete the challenging task afterwards, um, mm. which is why they came to that conclusion that willpower, it must be limited if um, exerting it previously impedes our ability to exert it in a later task. So after that study, they followed their curiosity and um, tried to identify what is it that's specifically limited um, in exerting willpower? Is there is there a resource? And they hypothesize... How can we fill the tank back up, in other words, yeah, right? Uh -huh. Like, if it drains. Yeah, exactly. And can we buffer against um, that draining willpower? So they hypothesized that glucose was the limiting um, factor. So if a person's um, blood glucose levels are low, then that would therefore um, impact their ability to exert willpower. 
So they hmm. did a similar sort of study as they did the first time, except in one group they had them consume um, glucose, a uh, glucose drink, and then in the other group, a uh, taste match control drink that had no calories or sugar in it. And afterwards, then again, they did another challenging task and was did drinking glucose influence their ability to um, try hard or complete the next, the following task? And they did remarkably, they found that glucose, well, remarkably in in some sense. Um, sure. It's, Logically, perhaps in others, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I think to us cyclists, it's like, well, duh, like if you're, if you're low, <laughs> if you've not yeah. got fuel in the tank, then you're not going to push hard. But this was a cognitive task. So um, it's exploring uh, willpower in a different domain that is not necessarily as dependent on our muscles being um, fueled sure. with glucose. Um, so that's when we kind of, so the, up until this point, um, it was assumed then that uh, willpower is a limited resource, as we said, and that we should use it carefully and prioritize it. Then um, another group of researchers came along and um, their uh, job and uh, colleagues, um, was job was the um, leading um, researcher. <laughs> Um, yeah, good to uh, clarify that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They hypothesized that if you believe that your willpower is an unlimited resource, then you have a greater ability to exert willpower. So it's mm -hmm. the classic case of um, if you believe it, you can do it or type that kind mm -hmm. of saying. Um, and that's what they found. They found that your personal theory did influence your hmm. your ability to exert willpower. I think it's an interesting, is it the chicken or the egg um, kind of scenario sure. in that like, are people who are innately able or who are innately higher on a trait, I'm not sure even if that is a trait or, um, but- Sure, just believe more. Yeah, yeah. Then and then their, their experiences reinforce their, and it's, you know- um, Self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Um, but it was an interesting, I think, again, like if we tie this back to endurance sports, we can hold both of these theories to be true or we can we can understand how both have some truth to them and could help us understand what could influence our um, ability to exert willpower. Sure. Um, like I need glucose and I need to believe that I can summon more willpower. And if I can do the, both of those things, then it's like having extra reserves in my fuel tanks. Like I'm able to, to do more with it. Yeah, exactly. It's optimizing your conditions. So um, like you're saying, it's ha like having the glucose, even other factors such as sleep. I know from personal experience, my willpower is definitely diminished when mm. I've not slept well. Um, so it's about learning that those things could potentially influence our ability to get that extra bit out of ourselves in workouts, especially people with full-time jobs and uh, busy and demanding lives. Then it's rarely do our workouts align on the most least stressful day that hasn't required anything <laughs> from us um so never it's about, happens yeah <laughs> yeah it's about realizing that in a more succinct way on the days that you feel like things are stacked up against you remember that willpower is not limited and there is a more in the tank there for you yeah if you can combine that with something of <clears throat> because it's always easier placebo effect is real that's got, similar to what we're talking about here and if you can attach the placebo to a physical object or a process that you can taste, feel, sense in some way, that's really powerful. That's why people will swear that, you know, putting their left sock on before their right sock is what they do on game day to be able to do better. Uh, it's golfers and they walk up to the tee and they have like a specific thing. There's a whole lot of other probably neurological science behind what they're doing there. But part of it is also the belief that if they do it this way, that it will allow for a better result. Yeah. And for us athletes, like if you have, for example, 
if you know that if you take in a banana, that banana gives you the glucose and that glucose will give you willpower. And that's how I can summon it. Summon it. If you find it difficult to just summon it without mm-hmm. any sort of object or resource or process, then you can attach it to something. Just make sure yeah. you have that object with you. And I think that's the the key from this is that you can blend the two. That it doesn't have to be an either or. You don't have to believe that it is strictly based on whether you believe it's a limited resource or not. And it doesn't have to be, no, it's strictly based on exogenous carbohydrate intake, you know, or something like glucose intake, and then that's how that works. But Mm -hmm. instead, you can use both of those things together, and they can give you a lot of strength. Like, intentionally, quote, placebo yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you want to call it that, um, and it improves performance. Definitely. And I think it's a great example of if we're challenging research continuously, which it should always be doing, you know, we don't ever come to a final answer, then it holistically informs us. So we can leave it to the researchers to debate Mm -hmm. whether it's a limited resource or not a limited resource, but there's valuable insights from both theories um, that we can apply to endurance sports. Um, And actually, there's one study um, by job and colleagues again um and this applies particularly i think to trainer old athletes who typically are very busy people um with lots of demands and they looked at um students during a very demanding um semester um and looked at whether their beliefs again influence their ability to exert self-control during that um, demanding semester and then how Mm. that impacted their grades um, subsequently. So it's like a process and an outcome there that we have in this study. And they found that the students who believed that willpower was not limited ended up exerting more um, self-control or willpower um, over various types of behaviours and then ultimately ended up with better grades than those who believed that willpower was um, a limited resource. I just thought for for all of us busy folk, it's reassuring to know that we can we can still do our good work after when life is busy. And believing that willpower is not limited and that I can summon more of it and maybe even having some sort of process or object to help us summon that mm-hmm. can really help us with that. Adding on to this, um, Sarah, really interesting. So this is a study by Berniker and Kramer in 2020, and the title is Implicit Theories About Willpower Are Associated with Exercise Levels During the Academic Examination Period. So students and finals, again, uh, this is in 2020, so not long ago. And uh, basically, the the question that they were asking, and I'm I'm just going to quote directly from it. They say, despite the negative consequences of physical inactivity on physical and mental health, many people are insufficiently active. We approach this problem from a self-control perspective, arguing that exercising competes with long-term goals people pursue in their everyday lives, like, for example, getting good grades in college, right, and going through finals. And then they say, in a pre-registered cross-sectional study with N equals 516 students, and they mentioned that 278 um, were remained after exclusion, they said, we tested whether students' implicit theories about willpower, as it being a limited or non-limited resource, are associated with exercise levels during their examination period. In other words, what they were doing is they were saying, all these people don't have enough time to do anything because it's a really important time in their life. So we're going to see if the people that exercise more often, what their beliefs are about willpower. And so this is strictly observational and it's strictly a correlation. There's no sort of intervention going on here. There's nothing like that. So I want to make sure that that's clear. So it's correlation. So, I mean, you could say that that's like, um, like an example of that with these correlations. I know you could say, well, in Nevada or like in the Sierra Nevada, there's a ton of fires. Um, there's also a ton of firemen. Therefore, if there's a place where there's a lot of firefighters, that means that there's also going to be a lot of fires and that's the firefighters don't cause the fires. Right. Um, so I know correlations are tricky, but just the same, we're going to tie this back in. So this is interesting. Um, it's merely again, a correlational observation, but those that viewed willpower as an unlimited resource exercise more often than those who's, who viewed their willpower as limited. And interestingly, those that did exercise exhibited better barrier management or like self-control over various behaviors, like you mentioned, Sarah. Um, so the behaviors that are commonly referenced are like, uh, restraining from eating like indulgent foods, uh, restraining from distractive episodes where they will, you know, pull away from the studying and 
they'll binge watch TV or something like that. It's, it's avoiding all of those things. So the people that exercise are actually, you could think expending more willpower, have less resources left after doing that yet. They are the ones that actually exhibit more self-control over various tasks outside of that. So the, what I'm getting at here is that viewing willpower as an unlimited resource could potentially help us athletes increase consistency because kind of like a student that's going through finals, you, the listener, listen to this right now, likely have a lot going on in your life. And if you have a lot going on in your life, it's very difficult to prioritize something like exercise. But this process of prioritizing important things requires self-control. And when we exercise that self-control, again, to Sarah's point, becomes kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense that we believe that we can do something, we do that thing, it requires willpower, and then that then enables us to do the same thing in other areas of our lives, which is really cool. And there's one other study that I thought was interesting with training and willpower as well. It's um, It says training willpower and this is how to train willpower is what they're talking about there. It's called reducing costs and valuing effort by out of friend and colleagues in 2022. This is more of a review, um, but it's basically like discussing the importance of lowering the cost of hard things that require willpower and then increasing the perceived reward of those activities and how those two things are what training willpower looks like. So basically it's saying that Let's say to, and we've talked about this a lot on the podcast, like that we've said, have your bike set up on your trainer. If you're going to do a workout like that, if you're going to do a workout outside, it's having your bike ready to go. The chain's lubed, your batteries are charged, your tires are pumped up, right? Those simple things. Reducing those sort of friction layers that you have to carve through every time to do this hard task. If you can reduce the cost of doing something difficult that requires willpower, you can do it externally in terms of making sure your tires are pumped up, making sure your bottles are filled, making sure that your bike's on the trainer, whatever it is. But you also, as you do them more often, you reduce the cost for your body to do those things and for your brain to do those things because the actions become automatic, less resources are required to think through how to do those actions. And then as a result, you're reducing cost to be able to do those things. If you do that, and if you can also repeatedly do these things and show the fact that there is a reward after I do this stuff, then what they are saying, the researchers in this paper, and this is more of like um, an opinion piece that they've written, observed from much research or much research that they've looked through. They say that doing that very thing helps us train and strengthen willpower. And it shows that in athletes that do these sort of things, they become more efficient externally, internally, and then that allows them to be able to execute tasks with greater amounts of willpower, or at least have more willpower at the ready, so to speak. So, yeah. I, and I think that this tackles the number one problem with training, which is consistency. Like that's, if you can find ways to increase your consistency, that's how you'll be faster. It's less finding the perfect workout. It's less even like, I need to find a way to raise my FTP. That's getting the cart ahead of the horse. Instead, it's, I need to find ways to make training more automatic in my life, less, uh, have less friction surrounding that, that activity. And if you can do those things with like what we've talked about here, that is what can enable consistency and consistency is what brings about adaptation. So yeah. it's quite interesting. I think you can also reduce the cost. Um, you said mentally, like, and I think often we perceive the cost in our head as like the pain that we're going to um, mm. encounter in the workout. What has worked for me before is kind of negotiating yourself into the workout. I'll say, okay, I'll at least do two sets or one set or whatever it is that makes that cost feel manageable. And then it's the next set and you're just like, taking on an additional cost gradually mm -hmm. so that the whole, the, the whole is not a daunting cost to begin with. Yeah. And that makes it so that you feel like you're expending less willpower so that you're saving mm -hmm. more in reserve. Same thing with like breaking up an interval, a long interval, like it's a 20 minute interval or something. And you say, well, let's just see how five minutes goes. Mm -hmm. And then after five minutes, you say, okay, next five. And then next five. And then before you know it, you're in the last five and you've already done three. And that's right. that perceived reward thing too, yeah. in the sense that like, I've already done three. It did, didn't cost me as much as I feared. 
and look at how far I am through this interval. This is great. Yeah. So all those things end up reinforcing this and making it so that it's less costly in terms of that willpower. Yeah. Super good point, Sarah. It's a good way to apply it intra workout. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Super interesting topic. Um, I think that the more, I mean, a lot of these things, perhaps you're listening right now and you're probably thinking of ways that you've already done it. And if so, if you have ways that you make your workouts quote easier in the sense that you reduce the amount of willpower that's required to either get on the bike or get through a hard workout, please type it down below. Um, so then other people can see them because once again, these are probably intuitive things that a lot of athletes have learned over time. Maybe you didn't realize that you were actually reducing or like sparing willpower or using it more efficiently, but let's put them down below. And I guarantee if we put a bunch of them down there, it will help another person get faster. And even if you're going to go down to write one, you'll probably see another one that'll help you out. So yeah. uh, super interesting topic. Cool. Uh, Sarah, anything else on willpower before we jump off onto the next one? No, I don't think so. Cool. Okay. So this one, this is going to be the last one, short episode this week. This one is interesting. Uh, it's kind of gets into the complexities of research. It's by uh, Rosenblatt, Michael Rosenblatt and colleagues. And this was published in September of 2023, fresh research. Um, so still warm, fresh out of the oven. And uh, Michael Rosenblatt is somebody that um, we uh, I've been in contact with before and spoken with and a great researcher that's doing great work, always looking into exercise physiology. So uh, I saw this, re this study and it, it definitely caught my eye. It says the additional effect of training above the maximal metabolic steady state on VO2 peak, watt peak, and time trial performance in endurance trained athletes, a systematic review and meta-analysis and reality check. <laughs> and that's what caused my, caused me to like, be like a reality check. What? Um, that's not a type of study. Um, so basically what this one is looking at is it's looking at how does training above or below threshold affect peak power, peak VO2 and TT performance in different ways. So like if I just train below or I just train above, and I know a lot of you are probably looking at this and being like, well, duh, you train harder, you're going to get faster. Um, but these are the sort of things that are important to call into question to see if it would indeed affect this, these sort of markers in different ways. So again, this was a systematic review and meta-analysis, meaning that what they did is they looked at a body of research and they set specific criteria for that research to then be able to whittle down from a massive amount of studies to a handful of studies. Then what they would do is they would run the results through statistical analysis to be able to see if they could find trends or consistencies or commonalities that would indeed indicate some sort of outcome. That's how those work. In this case, their inclusion criteria um, was uh, they had to have trained participants in the studies. They needed an intervention group and a control group that did either or above or below threshold training. And the outcomes had to be measured as VO2 peak or peak power or TT performance. What they did is they ended up going through and whittling it down. And they had 14 studies ranging from two to 12 weeks long. And it was in that those contained 171 recreational athletes. Remember, they were still trained. They weren't just average folks. And then 128 competitive athletes. So from this, what did they find? Well, the basics for power, peak power and TT performance, they couldn't get enough data for peak VO2. They found that yes, training above your threshold increased VO2 peak by a margin of 2.5 uh, for their VO2 max. So uh, 2.5 milliliters per kilogram per minute. Um, so yeah, that all makes sense. But here's the interesting thing. And here's the reality check part of this, of this uh, text. And I'm going to quote directly from it because I think that Rosenblatt and the rest Michael does a great job of explaining it. He says, an important finding from the current review was that all the studies included in the, po in the pooled analysis were significantly underpowered. And an underpowered study basically means that there weren't enough subjects involved in the study to be able to gather the sort of statistical significance to be able to reach outcomes. Basically, if it's underpowered, their lack, the study lacks resources, right? And resources in this case, in terms of the amount of data or the amount of subjects providing data. I'm going to skip around a little bit here, but it should all flow together. This suggests that the sample size of the included studies was too small, which is a common limitation in sports science research. Skipping around again, larger sample sizes are required when comparing interventions in already trained subjects because the expected change in outcomes such as VO2 peak and TT performance following interval training in trained individuals 
is less than half the magnitude of that which occurs in trained individuals. So in other words, what Rosenblatt's saying here is the fact that when you're trying to figure out what sort of training helps somebody get faster, you need a lot of people, especially with trained athletes, because you're dealing with noise. And that noise, in other words, the variance or difference from subject to subject, is even, I should say, the, in the improvement is many times smaller than the noise that you're getting between subjects. When you have trained individuals, their improvement is less. Just like everybody listening to this, uh, it's great when you first start training and you get like, you know, 20, 30, 50% FTP increases. And then eventually you're like, I'm going to fight for 1% this year, you know? <laughs> and that 1%, again, in these studies, you might actually have variance from subject to subject beyond that. In fact, you likely will. They go on to say, to obtain a power of 80% to detect a SMD, I'm going to explain that in a bit, of 0.44 for VO2 peak, the minimum sample size would need to be 81 participants per group in the evaluated intervention study. So they're talking about their specific studies, what they were looking at based on their calculations. Think about trying to prescribe training and control circumstances for 81 people. And then having to do it for the control group of 81 people, like, you know, dealing with 162 people and trying to manage that would be so difficult. I I don't know about you listening to this, but I can't even manage my own training sometimes, (laughs) (laughs) you know, like uh, in terms of eating consistently, and (laughs) sleeping consistently, doing my training like I should. It'd be really it's 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 untenable, really effectively. So I want to explain that SMD term. It's SMD stands for standardized mean difference. It's a statistical measure used in meta-analyses and systematic reviews, and that provides an indication of the size of the effect of an intervention of, or treatment, and it's independent of the scale of measurement used in the studies that are, when they're being combined. And this is useful because when different studies are using uh, different scales uh, to be able to measure outcomes, for example, like you might have various tests for psychological well-being or different physical tests for athletic performance, it becomes challenging to be able to compare those results directly. So they use SMD, or in this case, once again, standardized mean difference, and it's a way of crunching the data. Uh, They use that to be able to understand the mean outcome values for the treatment and control groups after the intervention. And the way that they do this is they calculate it um, by taking that, um, the difference in the mean outcome values, and then they divide that by the pooled standard deviation for outcome values. And this is probably too much math, but I figured I'd just explain it all. It's complicated statistics and I suck at statistics, (laughs) but you might've heard it sometimes referred to as Cohen's model, glasses, or Hedges model. And basically what it does is it provides that idea of magnitude of the effect of the intervention and can help you deal with noisy data and still understand if there's some sort of impact there. But to do that, you need a lot of data points to be able to calm that noise down and see the difference. So like, for example, they talked about just to reach a 0.44, that would be somewhere that's still not even a medium effect. So they say that zero suggested there's no difference between the groups. 0.2 might be small, 0.4, or sorry, 0.5 would be medium, and 0.8 would be considered like a large effect. So in this case, they're saying just to reach 0.4, or just to reach a medium effect, we would need 81 people in a study. So why am I saying this? Um, A lot of the time, we are eager and anxious to look at one study and to say this, and I'm not saying we as in us at Trainer Road, I'm saying we as humans. We want studies to back up something or to give us really clear direction. But the fact is, as they're showing here, and this is not necessarily, they aren't saying that every study needs 81 subjects, but they are saying that if you are dealing with this sort of research where you're prescribing training to somebody, seeing how it works, you need a lot of subjects because everybody responds differently to training. So you need a ton of subjects to be able to filter that out. So when we see a study, and if it just seems extremely conclusive that that's what we should do, and that's the one to go for, we should always keep a grain of salt handy. We should look at the sample size. In most cases, it's pretty rare to see a study with training interventions being subscribed to or prescribed to athletes with more than 20 subjects. That's quite rare. Um, more commonly, it's somewhere around 8 to 15 And at least in terms of what I've seen, Mm -hmm. and that's because it's really hard to manage this sort of thing. So just next time you see a study that says that sort of thing, take it for what it is. It's the study, it's the research, it's the data that they had, 
but keep the grain of salt handy and understand the fact that this is one study and it could very well be indicative of how individual people respond rather than how you are going to respond. Um, and I thought that it was uh, brave of Rosenblatt in this case to just come out and say like, look, if we're going to do this sort of research in the future, we need to do this because they do make a call out to other researchers like, please consider this when you're doing this sort of research that we need a lot of data or a lot of athletes. And it's not easy to be able to look at our own data and to be able to figure out what's making the change because there's so many factors that may be influencing things. It's really hard. Um, and the reason that we don't share data every day all the time is because we're still figuring out how to do that responsibly and honestly. There's a saying, if you torture data long enough, it'll tell you whatever it, whatever you want it to say. There's that temptation to always do that for somebody looking at data to just back up their own bias. But in our case, uh, we're digging through it, but we have immense potential because we have more than 81 subjects per group. We have a massive amount of subjects, over 250 million activities in our database. Um, so it's exciting uh, to think that we could use our data set to be able to understand all these things and as we are. And um, anyways, yeah, that's that's kind of it. I wanted to share that one. Great job, uh, Michael Rosenblatt, for being transparent about research. Pretty cool stuff. So uh, if you appreciated this episode, again, there are shorter episodes where Sarah and I dig into the research or share the research that we're digging into. If you appreciated it, let us know. If you have an idea for a topic for us to look into, also let us know down below. Uh, if you have a question about any of the studies that we've shared, you can check out the studies. We'll link them into the description, but you can also just ask us questions in the YouTube comments. Uh, that's a good way to do it. And you can send in your questions uh, to be answered on a normal podcast episode. And you can do that at trainerroad.com slash podcast. Thanks, Sarah. Thank good you. Stuff. That's great. Of course. All right, everybody. We'll talk to you next time. Bye.